Hello and welcome to this Wired virtual briefing on Will AI Kill the App? How generative AI is changing software development and perhaps ultimately software itself. I'm Charlie Burton. I'm the head of content at Wired's consulting division. And I'm here at ThoughtWorks's office in Berlin for this virtual briefing. Unless you've been living under a rock, you can't have failed to notice that over the past couple of years, AI has been resetting the tech world's center of gravity. One of the most immediate commercial applications has been generating computer code, and a new range of AI coding assistants has been changing the industry. And it's raising a whole load of interesting questions. How far will this go? What risks need mitigating? And what might generative AI ultimately mean for the kind of software that developers create? We've recently partnered with ThoughtWorks on a new report looking at these fascinating questions. You can read that on wired.com, and we'll give you a link to that at the end of this video. But to discuss further, I'm here today with Mike Mason, Chief AI Officer at ThoughtWorks, and Brigitte Berkeler, Global Head of AI for Software Delivery at ThoughtWorks. Thank you both very much for being here today. Happy to be here. So let's kick off by talking about the journey so far and how these AI coding assistants are already changing the game. So what kinds of things are developers using them for and what sorts of benefits are they allowing them to realize? AI tools have really caught everybody's imagination because it's actually possible to produce program code, which was always something that was kind of a little bit mystical. Uh, developers are kind of doing this dark art of sitting at the keyboard, writing arcane instructions and, and bending the machine to their will. And the fact that AI, which itself is kind of mystical, is able to produce program code has really caught everybody's attention. Um, and so in, in kind of the general public eye, that's one of the areas of AI um, that, that has a lot of attention. Um, it's actually very useful uh, for developers to be able to create program code using AI tools. You can do that in a couple of different ways. One of them is through kind of a chat interface with something like ChatGPT, uh, where you can actually not just get the AI to write you program code, but you can also talk about your problem. You can kind of say, this is the sort of uh, code or this is the kind of programming problem that I have and actually get the AI to work with you as a partner on how you might approach that problem, the kind of technology you would use to solve it. Um, and then the other way of using AI is actually within the IDE. So that's within the editing environment in which developers are creating code. Uh, you can inline use uh, uh, AI as a kind of uh, autocomplete on steroids where it will produce uh, several lines of code for you to, to help you uh, get, that, get that software problem solved faster. And this is changing productivity to what degree? Yeah, so, I mean, to answer that question, we would have to define how to measure productivity, right? And that's actually been uh, an age-old problem in software delivery because we don't have these nice little comparable units like an assembly line that we produce. So it's really hard to compare things to each other. Like what we're building this week, was that faster than the totally different thing that we built last week or not, right? Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of our clients ask us, you know, am I going to have 10% more productivity or 20%? But often when you use this number, it's actually a proxy for speed, right? A lot of people are mostly interested at the moment in how much faster are we going to be, right? And so it will be a question of um, are people using this to build more with the same number of people or to build better with the same number of people or to build the same that they're doing today with fewer people. And these tools have now become pretty standard practice um, in the industry. But like any new technology, there are trade-offs. What do you think the most significant risks or da potential downsides of this are? I mean, it's the, the same as, you know, when you're using ChatGPT and you're asking it uh, a question or asking it to do something, we all have to be aware that these uh, responses that we get are not perfect, right? And it has been talked about a lot that the responses often sound very reasonable on the surface, right? But then when you look a little bit deeper, you find, oh, that actually doesn't make sense or, you know, that kind of tricked me because it sounded so reasonable. And it's the same with the code suggestions. So often they look really good, they seem to work, but, you know, as as an engineer, you still have to check like, uh, um, for, for the little things that you might actually not even run into when you write this code yourself and step by step. Right? So that, that is definitely one of the risks because 
these um, models are trained mostly on the public code that is out there. And the public code on the internet and on platforms like GitHub is not necessarily the highest quality code that, that we have, right? Um, and it's also often not necessarily comparable with like um, an enterprise's code basis. Like there, it's a lot of open source projects that build more libraries than actual business applications. It's a lot of stuff that people just write in their free time, little hobby projects, and they put them public on the internet. So that's what the model is trained on. It's not like state of the art uh, code quality. Right? And I think it's important to remember that these AI tools don't actually produce answers to our questions. They produce something that looks like an answer. And uh, for, for most of the time, that can be exactly the same thing as exactly as useful as, as, a, as a real answer from something that does have understanding. But when you're doing something as complex and intricate as programming, anything, anything that's even slightly uh, out of line or, or incorrect can cause a, a problem and a bug later on. And because the code looks right, like it, it, has, the sh it has the right shape, it looks like that was the thing that you were intending, uh, it can be very easy to get kind of hoodwinked by the AI created code and for you to kind of, as a, as a programmer, trust it a little bit too much. That's one of the problems with AI systems is, is something called over-reliance, where you trust the AI a little bit too much. So there's clear upsides and clear downsides, but businesses need to create strategy, they need to act. So if you were advising somebody on how to get the best out of this while mitigating those downsides, what do you think the correct approach is? The first thing is definitely education and training and awareness of how to best use this for the engineers that are using it, right? And so it starts with like the simple guideline of you are still responsible for all of your changes. You cannot blame the coding assistant when something goes wrong um, with the software later. Um, and also giving them the chance to use this over a longer time to get used to it because it's this non-deterministic thing, right? So, and to kind of learn when should I trust it, when should I not trust it, you have to use it over a while and put your hand on the stove a few times to understand that. Then the second thing is to keep using the existing quality safety net tests uh, all, and, and all of the other analysis tools that an organization has. So it's actually potentially less risky for an organization that already has really good quality and engineering practices in place because they have a lot more safety nets. This space is moving really fast. So what are the emerging developments or trends that are most front of mind for your clients at the moment? There's a lot of competition between people who are creating AI tools because, you know, software is a $100 billion market and being able to produce uh, the best tool in that space is, is obviously uh, commercially valuable and, and companies are rushing towards that. Uh, so a lot of competition and new tools coming about. One of the really interesting spaces is something called AI agents, which is where an AI system can act on your behalf and take uh, a certain amount of steps autonomously. Um, so AI agents in the world today, you can use something as simple as ChatGPT to get it to do some uh, web research for you. I, I did this one morning, I was making coffee in the kitchen and yelling at ChatGPT on my phone to do some research into some clients, uh, and it was happily taking those steps on my behalf and, and assembling a, a report for me. So that's a simple agent. Uh, and then more complex agents, uh, we're actually starting to see software agents that can uh, automate some of the steps towards building pieces of software. So the agent will ask you for the kinds of things that you need and then actually spin up a, a development environment and start working on code on your behalf. They are very new systems. Uh, agents are typically very expensive to run. They re require a lot of uh, computing horsepower, um, but they're absolutely a super interesting area that a lot of our clients are looking at. So if we're talking there about an agent that can manage the process from writing the code to debugging it to deployment, I mean, that strikes me as quite a serious shift in what the job of a software developer might look like. What do you think the most interesting implications might be for how that reshapes the work, the industry? It's still a little bit unclear how good these tools really are. You see a lot of kind of cherry-picked demos online where it looks like the functionality is absolutely fabulous and it, and it just does all the right things. But uh, we certainly, our experience is that even with some of these uh, new AI tools, you absolutely still need a, a human in the loop to make sure that the 
the AI agent is doing what you actually asked for and not going off the rails. Um, I can definitely see an evolution of the way that we build software where humans are kind of taking a bit more of a design role and a bit more of a guidance role for AI. Maybe developers don't need to uh, you know, write lines of code anymore the way they used to um, and are instead uh, packaging up the, the requirements and feeding it to an AI and giving design suggestions, uh, moving away from that uh, writing individual lines of code. So let's talk about the jobs question, because that's kind of the elephant in the room here. Is this the end of learn to code? You know, is, does this end up replacing software developers? Because it seems fairly self-evident that if you can do as much or more with a computer program, then you potentially need far fewer people. My son is learning to code. He's 15 and, and learning coding in high school. And I'm pleased he's doing so because it's actually a really good way to learn how to structure your thoughts and to break down the problem into steps and give precise instructions about how to solve it. Uh, but he's 15 when he is going to go look for a job in, in you know, seven or eight years' time. I, I do think the job of a programmer could be very, very different than we see it today. Uh, but overall, I'm positive on this. You know, when other automation technologies have come along, when other technical shifts have come along, we've invented entire new categories of, of job. You know, social media influencer wasn't a thing a decade ago, uh, but that's actually a job that someone can do now. And I think we're going to likely see the same things with AI. There will be some disruption. Uh, one of the things about AI is it's hitting uh, across industries, lots of different job roles are, are potentially affected. Um, but in general, we, we see more things that we can do uh, with software, more demand for software. And so like overall, I'm, I'm very uh, excited about the future and the way that jobs might change. I suppose there's an argument that there's more software in the same way as spreadsheets created more analysts. Absolutely. And when, when you reduce the cost of something by making software cheaper to build, you tend to increase the demand for it. And it's not like um, there's any shortage of people who, who want some software in the world today. Can I ask you to make a prediction? What do you think the role of a software developer will look like in 10, 15 years' time, perhaps when your son goes into the industry? What do you think his job might actually involve? Well, we're already using AI beyond just code generation. So one of the things that we think is important is to use AI across all of the phases of software development from defining requirements through to actually doing the coding, uh, through to, to testing and deployment and an evolution of that, that software. So we're already seeing that AI has a role beyond just coding. Um, for the, the future of a, of a developer, I actually think it's going to free up uh, people to think about the higher level concerns. So uh, for example, rather than uh, needing to write lines of code, you can spend much more time thinking about system design, uh, system architecture, uh, spend more time as a developer working with the people who are going to use your software and understanding what they need as humans in order to, to achieve their goals. Uh, so I, I'm expecting this to actually become kind of a, a golden age of software, uh, increasing demand for software and also increasing the pace at which we can create it. I once saw a really good presentation about seniority in software developers. And the speaker talked about three levels of like being an implementer, a problem solver, and a problem finder. And kind of talking through how as a software engineer, you go through those phases. And the implementer is, you are that in the beginning when somebody gives you the solution to a problem and you write down the code for that. And that I'm already feeling like as the problem solver, as an experienced programmer, the implementation, the coding assistants take a lot of that um, uh, and, and, and help me with that. So I think it's going to somehow move up that stack. So you're going to be a problem solver, have to be a problem solver a lot faster than, than you have to do that today because the implementation will be so much smoother and there will be so much more assistance for that. A lot of the discussion right now is about how AI changes making software as we know it today. But what if generative AI could bring about a more fundamental shift in how we interface with computers? There's quite a lot of interest coalescing around the idea that it stands to give us a new breed of actually smart, smart assistants that could handle potentially quite complex tasks on our behalf and actually interface with third-party websites, tools, apps, 
for us, so we don't have to. We just interface with the AI portal. So the suggestion that this could be quite a major shift that software developers may have to design their tools around, that businesses may need to think about for how they design their services. Do you think this is a likely direction of travel? Yeah, I definitely think it's a very interesting uh, new area of product to explore, right? And I mean, people are already used to assistants like uh, like um, Siri and the Google Assistant. And, you know, so people are used to that and actually got that promise of getting these very smart assistants with them, but it hasn't quite panned out yet, right? So, but as, an, as a software engineer, of course, I think about the technical challenges of that, right? And I think um, one of the core things we will have to figure out or pull off is to make them in a way that people can actually trust them. So in the sense of like can trust the actions that they're taking, like when they're like creating a meeting or writing an email or calling somebody or sending a photo, are they actually sending the photo that I want them to send? Are they sending an email to my boss accidentally that I want to send to somebody else? So I think that will be really key that people trust that these things are really doing what they wanted them to do. And I think that's a really big uh, engineering challenge, so. So if AI gives us a major new way that we interface with machines, how should businesses be preparing for that shift? Well, we actually have a client who, um, one of their businesses is to interface with other people's websites uh, using AI tools. And they've been quite successful with that but it's also prompted them to take a look at their own website and see how accessible that would be uh, for an AI to interact with them. Uh, so that's another example of, of, of how you might need to change your own systems. On a, on a very positive note, we might find that personalized AI agents actually increase accessibility for, for websites. Certainly, uh, as someone who travels a lot, I have to interact with a lot of government websites when applying for visas and things like that. And I can tell you they're not all the most usable things uh, uh, for me. And uh, if an AI agent can actually get in there and, and, and help me fill out those forms, I'd certainly be interested uh, in seeing that. A number of startups are looking at what hardware looks like, what new forms of hardware look like in the age of AI? What does the iPhone for AI look like? And one of the hypotheses is that perhaps it's appless because the interface can engage with the services for you, so you're not having to open apps. Do you think AI is the end of apps? Does this kill apps? I mean, I guess it depends on how we define app, right? For me, as a software developer, an app is an application, and we'll always have applications, but it's now diff new interaction modes and new things that these applications can do, which is, of course, what you're getting at when you're saying, will it kill this current mode of interaction, right? Um, and I would think that uh, there's still uh, room for both, right? It depends on the everyday situation that we're in. Like, am I on a train that is like really moving around and um, where maybe I don't want to speak out loud, right? Or I don't have time to phrase a full sentence. Sometimes I just want to tap things, right? In other situations, other interaction modes can be more useful for me. And this opens up a whole uh, a range of options. And I also think it will very much depend on if we can give users this feeling that they can control what's happening, right? If it feels like very, uh, uh, if I can't trust this app or this like new interaction with it's, it's this smart assistant to do what I actually want, then I will not want to use it, right? Because I feel like, oh, maybe it's sending this photo that I don't want to be sent or, you know, doing something that I don't want it to do. Another dimension to this discussion is that generative AI models are foundational. They're potentially broad in what they can do, which is quite different from conventional software, which tends to be pretty task specific, and conventional machine learning, which is quite task specific. So there's a suggestion that potentially some of the roles that we ask other pieces of software to play could be taken on by the AI model itself. So this is not the AI model using the other tool for you, which is what we've just been discussing, but the AI model actually providing the service in the first place. Um, do you think that's the likely direction of travel? Do you think that's probable? I think we could definitely see a situation where a, an intelligent AI assistant, let's call it, uh, helps us with whatever task it is that we're, that we're doing. Uh, and that that assistant would be adaptable enough 
to both be able to uh, help me manage my calendar, look at my emails and figure out which of the several hundred emails I actually need to respond to versus, versus what's just at the top of the inbox. Uh, it's something that could give me advice for a, a trip that I'm booking and then maybe actually do some of those bookings on my behalf. So I do think this will become a more general purpose assistant um, and that that might uh, kind of start to reduce the need for a lot of those applications. What will happen though is app providers will resist this because if you currently are an airline and people interact with you through uh, the app that you've built, you get a lot of rich information about your customer. You've got upsell opportunities, you can understand exactly how uh, they're interacting with you and, and how often. If AI gets in the middle of that interaction, you're suddenly gonna start getting less information about your customers. So there's a real tension there as to exactly how much uh, the, the people who really provide the services, how much they're going to want things to be driven by AI. I really like this analogy of large language models as Swiss army knives. You know, a Swiss army knife does have a corkscrew, but, and you can open a bottle with it, but it's a lot easier to open the bottle with like a fancy corkscrew that, you know, is made specifically for opening a bottle, right? So you can use it for a lot of different things, but sometimes you might want something that's actually specifically made for that because you have a certain quality uh, requirement for it, right? I think a lot of the questions we've been looking at today, including questions around the extent to which software development will become automated, are also questions about speed of progress. Because if you think this stuff is going to happen really soon, then you've probably got a high degree of certainty and you're probably starting to prepare to act now. If you think it's further off, you probably think it's more speculative and you've got time to wait and see. So what I'd love to get a view from, from you guys, is what does the rate of change look like over the coming few years? Does it continue in this exponential way as it has done over the past couple of years? I mean, the pace of change has been extraordinary. Or does it plateau? So at the moment, we're not seeing any slowdown. Over the past year, the AI tools and, and models have continued to evolve and new capabilities land on us like every month, it, it seems like. And that pace of change is not slowing down. So certainly at the moment, it looks like we're still on a, a strong upwards trajectory. I do think it's very possible, though, that we will get to a point where we understand the things that AI systems can do and kind of have a, have a, have a box around that capability and understand, OK, we can now do these kinds of things and, and other stuff is, is beyond what AI on its own can do. I think that's actually quite likely to happen, is that, is that this uh, pace will slow down and we'll start to understand it a little bit better. But it's very difficult to predict. So the advice that we give to our clients is to engage with AI to experiment with it, um, actually to experiment responsibly with AI tools. So to put good guardrails and guidelines around that for your people who are using AI um, in order that they can have a kind of a safe experience with, with AI. And that can actually learn what things an AI system can do today, what it can't do, uh, where, where the fuzzy boundary between those things are. Because organizations that can stay close to the advancements in AI are going to be better positioned uh, to take on all those new capabilities. So at the moment, I don't see it slowing down from the technical side. So there's, of course, maybe a difference between what's going on behind the scenes and the pace of change there. So what I'm seeing as an engineer, you know, all of the developments and the, the potential, the papers that are hinting at things, and then two months later, you have a first implementation, which is different from the pace of change that the actual end users are seeing, right? So I think we might be getting into a period where this pace of change on the technical side is continuing to be as fast, but you know there might be a bit of a break for the users uh, to wait for some things to mature and then you know get new product ideas that they can actually use in a mature way. Sadly, that's all we've got time for today. It's been a fascinating discussion. It'll be really interesting to see how this space continues to develop. So Begita, Mike, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.